Our next speaker is the country director for Snow Leopard Trust. He uh, works with Nature Conservation Foundation. Uh, he's, most of his work has been in the Himalayas. Uh, he's one of the fittest person I know. He recently ran uh, 80 kilometers nonstop for 12 hours. Sorry, Kulu, I had to embarrass you. <laughs> uh, so that's Kulubush and Suram. He works on snow leopards and talk more about his work. Over to you, Kul. And thanks, Kalyan. Thanks to NIF for the opportunity to share the stage with some of the amazing speakers who've, who've come before me. I'm so much in awe of Mr. Nayak that I've forgotten what I wanted to say. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic work that he just spoke about. Um, I'm, a, I'm a scientist, and, and as part of my, my job is to ask questions. But I remember when I was starting out, asking questions was very difficult, because any question I thought of seemed to have an obvious answer. And I remember going up to the senior student who'd just published a paper and asking him, hey, you know, can you help me? And with a shake of his head, he said, you know what my father said after he read my paper? His father's an engineer, he said, and he'd studied how ungulates are distributed in relation to water holes. And his father read his paper and said, so you did all this research to tell the world that animals need water to survive. And that, that scared me even more. But I found relief in the fact that my father's a farmer, so he was unlikely to, to destroy my paper like that. So I went to my father and said, Dad, you know what, I'm going to study how carnivores kill livestock. And he said, sit down, beta. I'll tell you how they do this. When there is not enough prey in the forest, they come out and they kill livestock. So my, dis my thesis was destroyed even before it began. But nonetheless, I chose to continue with that idea and, and decided to question some of our basic assumptions or some of our basic stories or the standard narratives of, of conservation and conflict and, and things that work uh, and things that don't. Um, even though I was born in a small town, in a, in a small village near the Ajanta Caves, I decided to do this study with the snow leopard up in the mountains. Um, there had to be an element of, uh, element of adventure in this. Um, so to answer this question of why do snow leopards kill livestock, uh, I decided to, okay, a, a bit of a, a brief about snow leopards. They're found in, in the big mountains um, from the Himalayas all the way up to the Russian Federation. And, and, and they, they occur across all the major mountain ranges in this landscape, typically above the elevation of 3,000 meters, but I'll, I'll tell you cases where, as part in Mongolia, for example, they come down as low as 500 meters. Um, and the ambitious task I had in front of me was, uh, this is a map of Spiti Valley, about 4,000 square kilometers. I thought I would survey this entire 4,000 square kilometer, survey each and every village, find the villages where snow leopards are killing livestock, find the villages where they're not killing livestock, and compare wild herbivore population in these sets of villages. And, and that should tell us whether having wild herbivores reduces, conf uh, reduces livestock killing or not. Um, I found three things uh, in this study. First was that snow leopards were occurring across this entire 4,000 square kilometers. Whether it's a PA, not PA, didn't matter. They were there everywhere. The second thing was, yes, there were sets of villages that were losing livestock, and there were sets of villages that were not losing livestock. But the surprise was, villages that were losing livestock also had higher wild herbivores in, in the mountains around them. And that was a bit of a surprise. You know, the, the standard narrative didn't support it. Uh, so the hypothesis, we had, we had to explain that pattern somehow, and the idea was that maybe villages which have more herbivores have more carnivores also. And, and that's, why, uh, that's why they had more livestock losses. But that's just a pattern, and, and for science, that's not sufficient. Uh, you had to actually explain the mechanistic link of this entire process. Uh, so, well, I didn't have to ask a new question again. I could ask the same question and find a new answer for it. So then we designed a new study around, around this, where I thought I could go across to multiple sites, uh, which are along a gradient of wild herbivore availability, and then see how many snow leopards there are, what are they eating, how much wild prey there is, and, and how much livestock is getting killed at each of these sites. I didn't know what I was getting into, because that would require field work of up to four to six months in each of these sites. And once you commit, you go out and do it, and the, the good thing about this was some of my sites were in Himachal, in Ladakh, then in Mongolia, and more recently we've added sites in Kyrgyzstan. So the, again, the adventure part of it was that it got 
to, I got the opportunity to go to all these places. And this, this is now the, this was my first site, which is the Kibber, uh, you know, Kibber in Spiti, which has now become a very famous uh, place for snow leopard sightings. But this is back in 2007, uh, uh, one of the first pictures taken in that place. So most people know a lot about this site, but just right next door, there's this place called Lengthy Valley. If you notice, it's surrounded by 6,000 meter peaks on all sides, with just one place to enter. And you can't go in summer because this, the, the river is, it just comes down with all its might. So you have to go in winter when it's frozen, but in winter you have avalanches coming from both sides. So you need to camp in these rock crevices and know where to walk to avoid these avalanches, at the same time be on, on frozen ground. Um, so we did, we, we did this, this mega expedition to go and survey this site to find, to find, to count the number of snow leopards. I won't go into the methods, but we did, we used genetics and camera trapping, a combination of the two to estimate the number of snow leopards, estimate their diet, uh, estimate prey availability, and uh, this, was, this was one of those sites which had very little livestock, actually no livestock. Once you're in there, it's, it's worth all the effort. Um, I don't know what can be worth minus 40 degrees Celsius, but this definitely is worth minus 40 degrees Celsius for me. Um, after, after having fought through Lingti Valley, Lingti literally means an instrument that cuts rocks. So after having spent a lot of fieldwork time in that place in the cold, I thought I had seen it all. And then I went to Mongolia. I had I, one thing I was not prepared for, and which nobody warned me about, was the solitude. Uh, I was supposed to be here with another colleague of mine, Orian Johansson, who was collaring snow leopards, but he had an accident and, and he had to be evacuated, and that left me alone. And when I mean alone, it's, it was just me and a, and a camp in the middle of nowhere. There's, there was another herder who was my neighbor, who lived 25 kilometers this side, and the next one was 25 kilometers this side. I mean, I knew them better than I know my neighbors in this apartment. Uh, but that solitude, you could be here and spend days, weeks went by without seeing another human. And, and I would carry a sat phone all the time, but I would talk to everything, rocks, uh, there are no trees there, but rocks, the vehicle I was using and everything. That was one of the snow leopards we'd collared when Orian was still around. And more recently, we. We, we added a new site in, in Sarichat, uh, in Kyrgyzstan. The, the most amazing thing about this is this is not one of those tough sites. I didn't have to walk. I wasn't alone. This was a place where you could ride horses for hundreds of kilometers, and, and you basically did your entire fieldwork on horseback. And, and, and that was like a dream, dream come true from one of those Indiana Jones films. Um, the other amazing thing about this is I, I like to think of it like a high elevation Serengeti. The, the primary productivity of this landscape is so high that it's one of the, the prey, prey density here is one of the highest. Those are the Tian Shan Argali, uh, quite fearless. Uh, and Kalyan has forbidden me from showing too many numbers and graphs, but I could have shown this, this site is way out of the charts when it comes to prey densities. Uh, when one of my colleagues saw these argali, he said, the snow leopards there must be so healthy. So what did we find? One of the first premise we had was that when you have more prey, you will have more carnivores. And that, that was true. When you had more prey, you had more carnivores. Uh, the second premise was slightly more interesting. Snow leopards were killing livestock when livestock was really common, more, you know, when livestock outnumbered wild prey, four east to one, which is. So until then, snow leopards were not killing livestock. Uh, but the true picture is actually a combination of these two, and, and I don't want to... So the, the, the combination of these two things tells you, if you increase wild herbivore numbers, then there are more snow leopards, and so there will be more livestock that gets killed. If you increase more livestock, snow leopard numbers stay constant, but because there is more livestock, more of them will get killed. So there's actually no, no easy way out. And that realization helps you design conservation projects that are more realistic, realistic in giving you results that you desire. It's, it's not a promise. Uh, so, so now we know that increasing wild herbivores is not going to, is not going to solve the problem. And, and, and that gives, gives you 
and new ideas. So this is the same site in Mongolia, and this was my neighbor 25 kilometers away. Uh, this area, thanks to the work of my colleagues in Mongolia, has now been declared into a protected area, and we know wild herbivore populations will go up. And when that happens, you have to be prepared. So we are helping them protect their livestock from carnivores, uh, even before the problem actually uh, increased more than what it already is. Uh, alongside, I, I was doing another study, which was about the whole social dimension of the problem. What are the factors that determine human attitudes towards carnivores? When do humans retaliate? The, the first study we did was only in Spiti and Ladakh, but now we have data on the same from Kyrgyzstan, Mongolia, and China. Uh, I won't go into the details of the study, but everywhere there are different important factors. Like in India, education is a very important factor in how people perceive wildlife. But one factor that is common across all these countries is women seem to have poorer attitudes towards men. And, and it was very puzzling. I mean, why would that be? And then I spoke to um, the, the social scientist, uh, Dr. Monica Ogra, and she has this hypothesis that in, in areas where you have conflict, it's women who bear the hidden cost. Cost of reduced nutrition, cost of increased working hour, cost of increased uncertainty. Um, the other hypothesis is that no conservation agency usually talks to women. And, and that, that opened a, a, whole, um, a whole new area of, of conservation intervention that, that was a problem that was right in front, but, but we weren't looking at it. And, and that led to uh, the Snow Leopard Enterprises or Shen program. It had been around for a while, but now we knew the exact role for which it, it fit. Uh, and, and yesterday, Munmun had spoken briefly about it, the uh, day before yesterday. And uh, my colleague Preeti is outside. She has a stall about this, and, and you, can, you can find out more there. Um, so in, in, uh, together, the, the point I wanted to make was that uh, through, our through my research and through our, my colleagues' research, we, we try to question some of the assumptions that go into our basic understanding of ecology, conservation, and the solutions that we implement, uh, with the idea that, that every time we question an assumption, and that, that, that questioning leads to newer ideas. Uh, questioning assumptions is not bad. It's, it's not a... Um, the role of science is to be disruptive, not to be destructive, but to reconstruct ideas of, of conservation. And, and that's what we've been trying through, through some of our science. And of course, all this work is, is not my work. It's, it's all these colleagues and all these institutions. I've, I've been very fortunate to work, work with a whole, whole group of people and a whole host of institutions in, in this journey. To go back to my friend's story, actually his story was more complicated than that. It's not that animals just need water to survive. The other thing he'd found was that there was also a correlation with NDVI, NDVI um, with vegetation. And what he'd found was animals prefer water holes that were in open habitat because they, they also need security. They also need to be able to watch out for, um, for those other, other carnivores. Um, and the idea is that, the, 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 the point I want to make is that Sometimes, when we try to simplify down our stories, they fall back to the, the standard narrative, and, and it's important to, to retain that nuance in every time we, we tell our stories. Thank you. <laughs>